Hi everyone, this is Candidate Master Isaac Steinkamp here to talk about the Chess Summit sweepstakes and what that means for you and what you can win for free if you enter a Chess Summit World Cup sweepstakes by 6.59 a.m. Eastern Time on September 3rd. So we have a lot of really cool prizes. When I opened up the sweepstakes, you know, I could have never imagined having so many prizes from all over the internet um, and with so many, you know, great platforms and whatnot. I thought this would be a great time to talk about some of those prizes as well as what are my thoughts for the World Cup? What is it going to take for certain players to go far into the tournament? Of course, it's a 128-player field, and two of them will qualify for the candidates tournament in 2018. So, you know, I'm really excited about that. So on August 25th, I opened up the sweepstakes, and I have a little article here that I'm going to link below in the video, and it's just simply talking about the different rules, shows you the bracket, and a link, direct link to the sweepstakes right here, uh, as well as, like, talks to you about prizes and the deadlines, of course. What I want to talk about today was the different platforms that we're offering um, prizes on. So the first one that I wanted to talk about was Chessable. So here's the dashboard for Chessable. Um, we're offering five memberships from here, as well as five copies of John Bartholomew's Scandinavian book, um, which is pretty popular, so I'm really excited about that. And so what are some cool things about Chessable? So on our dashboard, we have access to all these books here, and I'm going to talk about these in a second. Uh, but let's go to tools really quick. One of the things that I like about Chessable, um, you know, is in terms of like an opening exploration kind of idea, is to just simply talk about, uh, you know, like being able to navigate the opening on your own, opening curiosity, right? So, you know, let's say if I'm trying to learn E4, you know, and I wanted to learn about the Karakon, right? And I wanted to know like what are good moves to be playing against the Karakon. So, you know, here I can already see like the different number of games and what white's scoring in each, and already I can see that in the panel, white scores really well, so C4. Okay, so now we look at what black plays here. So d5 seems to be the most common move. And here we can start to see the breakdown, the decomposition of how uh, each line is played. So here it looks like ed5 is more popular. Um, cd5 is still more popular. And here I have a bunch of choices. I could play d4 if I wanted to. I could play cd5. Knight f3 seems to be an option. But let's say I wanted to be cheeky and look at this move d4 and say that we've gotten some sort of queen's gambit transposition or slav transposition. Um, so knight f6, knight c3. Knight c6, bishop g5, bishop e6, and I can just continue looking through the lines and look at what scores. And this could kind of help me narrow down maybe one, uh, what is a line that I should be focused on, what is a line that maybe I shouldn't be so concerned, and if there's a line that scores badly, what is like the proper way to handle it. That's really nice. What I really like about uh, what Chessable did is they took it a step further and integrated it in with their books platform. So if I go back to the starting position, and let's say I looked at the... Um, looked at the slot, right? So let's let's just go ahead and skip through some of these lines. Knight f3, knight f6, knight c3, d c4, a4, bishop f5, knight h4. And already you can start to see here that, you know, after e3, we start to get into some of the depth of the book, right? There's bishop b4, there's bishop d6. And in the book, okay, uh, Lytau talks about bishop b4, bishop c4, and we can kind of narrow it down. But let's say, you know, his recommendation is to play queen c2, but I wanted to look at this move, bishop d2. I could add this book, add this to my book on the slot and come back to it later, which is really important. That means I can save it and move on. So like if I'm in a time crunch and I find the move and I need to go somewhere, I can save it and come back and look at it later. So this is something that's um, that's really nice. So this is the opening explorer tool. There's an analysis board. You can do various setup positions. You could start a book. But what I wanted to look at was some of the opening books. I know that Chessable just offered a end games book on, you know, with new in chess, and like on, you know, important end games you have to know, and that's really important. I featured that on the site. But Chessable is, of course, known for opening preparation. So I want to talk a little bit about this. You can buy books on Chessable, which is really cool. And there's, of course, some uh, that are free as well. So there's various free books. There's a free Scandinavian book. Uh, and this 1d4 repertoire book is also free. So let's open up this really quick. One of the things I really like about how Chessable presents opening training is by forcing you to kind of be more interactive, take take pride in your learning. So I'm going to open up the d4, d5 lines, and let, let's learn some lines um, of the Queen's Gambit Accepted. This is kind of becoming a little bit trendy lately, but this will also kind of show you how do you learn how to use Chessable. So, all right, so start learning, and we get the Queen's Gambit Accepted position, and here John's going to recommend this move e3, and he gives you some pretty concrete advice as to why e3 is uh, the better move to play. Of course, e4 is definitely main line, but it's definitely 
been in the spotlight lately is a more challenging move. A game off the top of my mind is um, Alexei Shiroff versus Robert Riss at Reykjavik. I was actually there uh, at that tournament when that game was played. Uh, and that was a very complicated position. E3 is a lot more simple, and that's exactly what he says here. All right, see, so they're going to quiz you on this move. Okay, he wants us to play E3. We get some points, B5, and we're going to start undermining the black queen side. So A4, and so black plays C6. And if black wants to support the chain, then he must pin his hopes on the C pawn because if AB6, AB5, AB5, we win the rook, right? Because if he plays A6 instead of C6, um, you know, we're, we're winning the rook because of the pin. So here we're taking... And now we have this nice trick, queen to f3. And this is actually a really important trick to know. And if you're a beginner and you're trying to learn the queen's gambit, how to play against the queen's gambit accepted, uh, this is probably one of the first things you learn about it. So here we take, take, and queen f3. And we're going to get quizzed one more time. And this kind of repetition forces you to kind of remember the line, but also remember the ideas. You know, if I were just playing this blindly, it'd be easy to get move orders wrong. Um, but this is fairly concrete. And by remembering the advice that he gives us along the way, you know, he, he gives us a good idea as to how to continue. And so we earn some points, which is nice. You know, earning points is always good. And we get to move on to the next chapter. And this is how learning openings on chess, chess levels like. Of course, that was a pretty simple line. For some of these more complex lines, they're going to involve some more dedicated study. So that's chessable. Let's talk a little bit about Chess Openings Explained. Chess Openings Explained is Eugene Perlstein's website. Growing up, when I didn't have that many options in terms of how to study online, Chess.com was my main outlet, and Eugene Perlstein's videos um, was definitely my main source, you know, of opening knowledge, and he actually is now my coach. So, you know, I actually help write some content for ChessOpeningsExplained.com, like I write this newsletter here, you know, every time we come up with new videos, and there's some tactics for you guys in the membership, but there are two really cool features about Chess Openings Explained. While Chessable is more of like an interactive platform, the one thing that I like about Chess Openings Explained is that you can watch a video and the the rest of the game played by, you know, Eugene Perlstein or whoever it may be. And then after that, you could download the PGN and get notes. So like, for example, here is the Jabava attack, which is a line that Daniel Naroditsky played against Eugene Perlstein of the Washington International. And Eugene actually won that game with Black. So here he is talking about that line. Uh, you can watch the video here and you can download the PGN here with notes. And you can, you know, feel free to send us any comments that you have here. Um, but another really cool feature that sometimes, you know, it's, it's hard to get access to unless you have a coach is to ask a question to the, to Eugene himself. If you enter in your name, your email, and send us your, your thoughts on the line, you know, we'll respond to you as soon as possible. So here's a line that, you know, someone asked about the white book and the black book, which you get for free as a member of Chess Openings Explained. And here's Eugene's answer. So he gives a little bit of analysis here. Um, so if we go here. He gave a pretty detailed analysis here as to what he recommends for the line. So, you know, having an interactive platform like this to be able to ask questions about what you want to use is definitely really helpful. So, you know, that's one of the really cool features about ChessOpenSplain.com. Another really nice thing is with the membership, you get to have one of your games analyzed by a GM. So, both Chessable, Chess Opening Explained are offering memberships here with us on the Chess Summit sweepstakes. I think both are really great platforms to try to take your chess to that next level. Um, and we're offering some other prizes as well, including a free 30-minute lesson with I am Kostya Kavutsky. He's also willing to offer a, offer a personalized game analysis. From what he tells me, he wants to kind of go Gordon Ramsay style and, you know, kind of give you as much as he can give you. So that's, you know, definitely a prize that you want to win. Um, International Master David Brodsky is offering a 30-minute blitz session. So you get to try to see how well do you stack up against an I am. And... I'm offering a private game analysis as well. Rather than publishing it on the website, this would be specifically for you. So I'll give you opening recommendations, things to worry about, why not based on the game that you sent. So I'll go you know, more in depth than I usually would with a free game analysis post. Um, so you can check out more about each of the individual prizes with each of the links I sent you. I'd recommend watching some of the videos um, that I attached. So like here's John Bartholomew talking about how to learn with the end, game, end games you must know series on Chessable and so forth. So, of course, what you you guys want to know is what are my predictions for the 2017 World Cup. So let's go ahead and enter in the sweepstakes. So I'll just I'll just walk you through how to enter using like my own stuff. Um, and so I'm obviously not going to count my own submission here for prizes, but just to kind of walk you through. So you guys need to give us your email. Um, so in that way, we know we know who to who to contact. Um, so let me put in the chess summit chess summit email. Wow, my typing skills are off today. Gmail.com. So there's our email, um, Isaac. And so 
let's go ahead and walk through this. So here's the bracket right here. If you guys need a refresher on the bracket, and of course I've attached the rules here as well as mentioned some of the prizes. And here's the deadline right here. That's 6.59 a.m. Eastern time, September 3rd. Make sure to submit by that. All right, so who do I think is gonna win the World Cup? So I've seen a lot of different submissions here. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of Magnus Carlsen, I've seen a lot of Nakamura, I've actually seen a lot of Aronian now that he's won the St. Louis Rapid and Blitz. Um, but I'm going to have to go with my countryman here, Hikaru Nakamura. I'm going to talk a little bit more about Carlsen in a second because there's a question specifically for him. Um, but I think Nakamura is on the easier side of the bracket. Um, he doesn't have to deal with Svidler, Carlsen, Grishuk, uh, Wojtaszek, and all those kinds of players. So I'm going to give Nakamura an edge there. I think he has an easier path to the final than anybody else. So I think Nakamura has to be favored uh, Aronian would definitely be someone who I'm interested in, uh, but you know the reason why I have a hard time picking Aronian is when I watched the 2015 uh, World Cup in Baku, he had won the Sinkfield Cup two weeks before, and he looked like he was playing the best chess he had ever played. And I think he got eliminated in the second round or third round by Arshchenko. Uh, not saying that Aronian is going to go out early is my prediction, but him winning the St. Louis Rapid and Blitz and then going to the World Cup kind of feels eerily familiar. So unless I see you know, something else early in the tournament, I have to stick with my guns and say Nakamura. Who's the runner-up? I'm going to actually go out here and say Peter Svidler. Um, I think Peter Svidler is someone that not a lot of Chess Summit submissions, uh, Chess Summit sweepstakes submissions are giving enough respect to. Um, I think Svidler, even though he has a really hard path to get to the final, you know, when I think about his previous World Cups, um, I think every single one since going back to 2007, he's at least made the quarterfinal. Uh, and if he can get to the quarterfinal in the bracket that he has, then he has to be in really good form. So I think he has a really good chance of making it to the final, but unfortunately I have him losing once again, uh, just this time to Hikaru Nakamura. So that kind of answers the next two questions. Um, Nakamura and Peter Svidler. Of course, uh, in terms of you know entry for our submission, this is of course a very risky strategy. You can see how many points each question is worth. World Cup winner is six, runner-up is four, and then best for each nationality is two. So by doubling down, you know, it's it's a big risk, but um, we're going with that. Which Chinese player do I think will go the farthest? Um, well, with the Grand Prix, you know, it would be tempting to say Ding Liren, um, but when he played Wei Yi in the, last, um, in the last World Cup and got eliminated, I just think that there was a bit of an edge there that Wei Yi had over Ding Liren. And that being said, I think the player to watch out for the most right now is actually going to be Li Chao. So I'm going to pick Li Chao to be the best Chinese player in the World Cup. Do all the top eight seeds go 2-0 in the first round? Um, I think last year it was really close. I think it was 7.5 to half because Anish Giri drew. But, you know, I think one of the things that makes this question tricky is when you look at, like, the 1 versus 128 matchup or the 2 versus 127 matchup, it's really easy to see that rating differential. But there's a lot of strategy uh, in the World Cup. So let's say if Magnus Carlsen wins the first round, I don't think it's likely that he'll take a quick draw in the second game, but, you know, he has no incentive to play for the win because he's already made the money for that round, and he's already qualified for the next with a draw. So do I think Magnus in particular is going to do that? Of course not, but it's very likely that a player in the top eight will wind up doing that. So I'm going to go ahead here and say no. I don't think that all the top eight seeds will go to on the first round. Which player will score the most draws? So... I've had a lot of interesting submissions here on Chess Summit. A lot of people are saying Sergei Kuryakin. A lot of people are saying um, Anish Giri, of course, because of that candidates tournament. Um, I think Anish would have been the pick to make in 2015. But if you've been following you know, his opening choices and whatnot, he's deliberately been choosing sharper stuff. So I think Anish is more likely to have more decisive games than he has at any point before. But I do think Sergei Karyakin could be an interesting choice. But now that I'm thinking about his 2015 performance, I think most of those games in his qualification were pretty decisive. So who do I want to pick? Um, let's see. Generally for these, you know, I, I think for most draws, I'd want to pick someone going far. So I'm going to choose Wesley So. Um, not saying that I think Wesley So is a very drawish player, but, you know, in the World Cup, you have to be very practical, right? If you have black... Getting a draw is a great result because that means you get to play with white. And Wesley So is a player I think could go far in the tournament. Obviously not. I don't have him winning the tournament. Um, but, you know, winning one and a half to half is not a bad result at all because you just want to move on to the next round. And he's a guy that I think isn't afraid to go into a tiebreak, so draws aren't going to hurt him. And he has a very solid opening repertoire with black. Who's the player that is going to score the most wins? Um, so Hikaru Nakamura would be a very tempting choice, I think, uh, because I have him winning the tournament. But just to kind of diversify some answers here, I think Magnus could be an interesting choice because I could see him going 2-0 until he gets eliminated. Um, another player that I think could be an interesting choice is just simply Jan Nepomnishi. If I, 
you know, if I recall correctly, um, you know, at the St. Louis Rapid and Blitz. Let me make sure I spell his name correctly. Nepomniachtchi. There we go. Um, when I watched him at St. Louis Rapid and Blitz, he had a lot of games that, you know, offered a lot of chances to be decisive results. And, at the, and I think that was very much the same with the Louvain Rapid and Blitz as well. Um, top rated player below 2,700. So my favorite player is David Howell. Unfortunately, even if he beats uh, Ariantari, he's playing Ariantari in the first round. He's going to be stuck in a match with either Alex Lenderman or Pavel Ilyanov. Pavel Ilyanov, of course, making the final four in the um, in the previous World Cup. So even though I really like David Howell, I don't think that that's the safest bet for uh, top player under 2,700. We've had a lot of people here pick Jeffrey Zhang uh, and whatnot, but I'm going to go with a pick that my colleague David Brodsky recommended, uh, David Rodstein from Israel. Um, his, you know, I, I think that, you know, he's going to be a slight underdog to get uh, as far as he can into the tournament, but uh, I think in, in terms of where he is in the bracket, I think he, he's got a nice nice position. Uh, Sam Copeland from Chess.com actually sent in a submission for us. He has uh, Baskaran Abidan going, which I also think is a very, you know, good pick. Top Junior. So a lot of people here are just picking either Wei Yi or uh, Jeffrey Zhang. Jeffrey Zhang, I think, would have been an attempting pick back in 2016. Uh, but given how he performed in the match, the Millennials, I think he's got a tough road. He's got to, first of all, win his first round. But then in his second round, he has to, you know, he's most likely to play like an Anish Giri type. So I'm going to stick away from Jeffrey Zhang. Sim Sevian would be an interesting pick. But again, I also think he struggled at the match of Millennials. And I believe in the first round, he's going to miss a piano, which is not an easy match by any, any means whatsoever. Uh, I'm going to go with a player that not many people are talking about, Matthias Bubom. Just because he's got a lot of recent top level experience lately. I believe he played at both Grenka and Dortmund, and he won the Grenka Chess Classic back in 2016. So he's been a trending grandmaster that I think has a lot of potential to do well in this tournament. Um, do any former world champions qualify for candidates 2018 through the World Cup? Now, because of the way that I have, you know, I have my finalist being Peter Svidler at Hikari Nakamura, my answer is going to be no. But to kind of clarify it for anyone out there, let's say if Carlson makes the final. So if Carlson makes the final, that means he's not going to qualify for candidates because he's already the world champion. So another candidate is going to have to be determined, whether it's through a third place match or it's just awarded to someone, you know, it's neither here nor there. So there is a chance where Anand Kramnik or Ponomaria, former world champions, could earn a spot by not necessarily having to, go, having to go to the final. If, like, let's say they lose out to Carlson in the semifinal, they still have a pretty good chance of earning that candidate spot. So this will be determined once the candidates... You know, the candidate slots are awarded to respective players. All right, and the big one, does Carlsen make the top four? So Carlsen, of course, is the fan favorite here to win. He's been the one seed, and everyone's talking about how great he's been playing. I'm going to have to say no. And I actually have him losing the fourth round to Peter Svidler. And I want to talk about that a little bit. I think Carlsen being the one seed, of course, he deserves it. He's the strongest player in the world. He's reigning world champion. Of course, he deserves to be the number one seed. Um, and I'm not even picking him to not make it to the to the quarterfinals and beyond, not because of the recent news about how he's been struggling and whatnot. I know Norway chess is a bit of a bummer. And then Singfield Cup didn't go the way he wanted because of that loss to MVL. He made up for it with the last round winning against Levon Aronian, but I don't want to say it's something that's missing. It's just that the World Cup's not a tournament where Carlson's as experienced as the other players in his bracket. And when I look at the people who are in his bracket, off the top of my head, he's got Bu Zhangji potentially in the second round, who's a strong Chinese player who just hasn't been as active lately. Peter Svidler is there. Maxim Bashir Lagrav is there. Alexander Grishik is there. Those are just players that he has to get through to make it to the quarterfinal. And the reason why I'm going to have Svidler beating Carlsen in the fourth round, not it's not a disrespect to Carlsen thing. Peter Svidler has a history of making the quarterfinal and beyond every single World Cup since, I believe, 2007, maybe even further. Uh, and he has a history of making the final consistently. Um, this, is, this is Svidler's tournament. And if he gets paired with Carlsen in the fourth round, I do think that you know, there's going to be a lot of pressure on Carlson to win, and there's going to be no pressure on Svidler to perform in a tournament where he's historically done well at. And I think that that puts Svidler in a slight advantage. Um, so I'm going to have to go with, because of Svidler, I don't have Carlson making the top four. I think if it had been another player um, who wasn't Svidler, maybe, maybe I could pick Carlson to make the top four. But because of that, just not seeing it. Uh, make sure to tweet at us with your predictions. It's simply one point. Uh, we've had a lot of people tweeting at us, and that's you know made things really exciting. So here's my here's my Twitter username. Feel free to tweet at me as well. I'm not a robot, and you can go ahead and submit. Once you submit, you're officially in you know the World Cup sweepstakes, and you're logged in our program. So that's a wrap on how to submit to the World Cup. My thoughts on the World Cup, as well as what are some cool prizes. Make sure that you get those submissions in. 
before September 3rd at 6.59 a.m. Eastern time, and we'll be tracking the results along the way. We'll may, we Maybe we'll even tweet at you if you start doing really well or make a pick that no one else picked uh, in the sweepstakes. So until then, this is Isaac Steinkamp signing off with some cool prizes at the Chess Summit World Cup sweepstakes. Until next time.